Hey folks, Steve here with another World in Flames video for you. I am going to be covering uh, the way that World in Flames covers World War II in the Middle East, which is uh, just something coming out of uh, some interest that I'm doing, some reading I'm doing, um, as, a, as it relates to another game that I'll be playing on the channel here very soon. Um, and I'm sort of, you know, in this space uh, or on the topic of uh, World War II in the Middle East. And because this is just the way my brain works, I like to look at the bigger picture. And then that means I'm looking at World in Flames in terms of war gaming as my sort of strategic level uh, game of choice. Um, and I, you know, I, I get a lot of joy and a lot of fun out of looking at how do games choose to represent the historical events that occurred um, you know what, what are they trying to achieve to what level of abstraction do they go to and can they actually simulate the conflict in some way right I think abstraction always gets in the way of some things sometimes but but generally um, you know good games do do it well to, to whatever degree that they can manage and, and world and flames it can be tough because everything is typically core level sometimes you have some division level units and there's some stuff some events that just occurred at a level so much lower than the scale that world and flames tends to show that strategic games tend to show but uh in just kind of comparing notes and looking through things i, I did find uh it interesting how how world and flames shows uh the events or or can kind of reflect the events of World War II in the Middle East. And when I say that, I do mean a very specific set of campaigns or operations events that in terms of, you know, popular history, pop history, or your partially fictionalized movies, your uh, documentaries that you might see on the History Channel or, or even YouTube or whatever venue you watch your documentaries, um, you know, so much covers uh, the obvious areas, the obvious theaters um, that that occurred in World War II. But what tends to be forgotten is the events in the Middle East. And sometimes I wonder if that's because some of the events that occurred there are a bit grayer in terms of, you know, that clear delineation between, you know, what we think of as what the good guys would do. Um, some actions taken, you know, out of it almost feels like expediency or convenience that may not always mesh very well with our, our perceptions of maybe the allies and it it's such a weird thing to talk about um, and that's not to say that you know the allies weren't the good guys in World War two they most certainly were absolutely but there are some events that you can look at and go well you know maybe this isn't why we we don't talk about it very much um, in the history books or, or show in the movies or at least cover in a lot of detail uh, though I think there are a few exceptions to that I think there's a couple maybe one or two movies that are out there that cover some of this stuff so anyway not not to belabor the point I want to kind of get into things so when I say you know World War two in the Middle East what do I mean um, I mean basically three sets of campaigns the first actually started with uh, Iraq and that is, uh, which, you know, it's, we're kind of split map here in Vassal, so it's going to be a little weird to kind of scroll back and forth and show, where you have the western uh, part of Iraq, Mosul, a couple of oil resources, and then on the Pacific map, you know, which links here, uh, you know, Baghdad, Basra, and, you know, then adjacent to it are obviously Iran and Kuwait, which will matter for the discussion here. Um, but there was basically, you know, at, at the start of the World War II time frame, um, Iraq was basically aligned, you know, politically aligned with uh, Britain in game terms in World and Flames. They're just merely an independent country, but they start the game with some trade agreements in place. So Iraq uh, is neutral. It supplies France with one of its resources. And then if it is con if France is conquered, or a Vichy government is installed, then they're going to provide that resource to whoever controls Syria. Um, and if that country is Vichy, then they're going to carry on and pass that resource to what will very likely be Germany, right? 
So, so as a part of it, it's like, you know, Syria has a pretty good chance to be Vici after the Vici process is executed. And then, uh, you know, one of the resources from Iraq, which would be, you know, one of these two, gets, you know, railed here and then gets sent through the Mediterranean or potentially uh, other railing solutions, which um, I'd have to I'd have to understand the limits on Turkey, but I think it could be railed through Turkey. Um, the point is, you know, at, at the start, uh, the Allies are basically getting a resource. France is getting a resource from Iraq. Iraq is, you know, very lightly aligned to the to the UK, to the Commonwealth, but in game terms is neutral. Um, and what had happened was that, you know, historically the the Iraqi government had a coup occur that was sort of pro-Axis, and then with the fall of France and Vichy being established in Syria you sort of had this minor axis block starting to form um, between, Syri you know, the Vichy-controlled Syria and Iraq and Germany's instructions um, and all kinds of stuff where, you know, air bases were being used uh, in Syria by the Germans and, and stuff that is, again, at a level a little bit below what world flames can typically, typically show. Um, and so in response or, you know, as a result of some of that, eventually in... Uh, May of 1941, uh, we basically had uh, the uh, Commonwealth, you know, head into Iraq proper and sort of reestablish control, which, you know, really then meant that, you know, the Axis was not going to get these resources unless they seized it themselves. But to make sure that that didn't happen historically, then we had what is known as Operation Exporter which had uh, British forces uh, in Egypt and Palestine basically push north and uh, we'll say in World and Flames game terms conquer Syria from Vichy. You know, they, and, and in game terms for World and Flames they declared war on Vichy and would take it. Uh, now the Vichy rules in World and Flames can be very confusing for folks. Um, it, it can even still be confusing to me sometimes. There's this whole element of, like, you can declare war on Vichy, but not be quote-unquote hostile, which means that you've somehow infringed upon metropolitan France, you know, Vichy France, you know, here. As long as you don't have allied units attacking here, you can declare war on them and focus on these other territories. Um, and, you know, there's certain advantages or disadvantages to that, but basically... Removing the ability for uh, the access to make use of these oil resources, um, you know, means conquering uh, Iraq, getting to Baghdad and conquering it so that these resources go and stay Commonwealth controlled and then capturing uh, Syria just to make sure that um, the Axis could not, you know, come in here and collapse uh, Vichy, you know, take control of Syria and basically have their own path uh, to get into uh, these regions with the oil. Um, and just so that the Allies could have greater control of the Mediterranean. So that's sort of the second part of the middle of World War II in the Middle East. And then the third part is, uh, and, and I'll say Operation Exporter was through June and July of 1941. And then just after that, in August 1941, you had a combined invasion of Iran, the Soviets invading from the north and the British uh, invading basically from Basra. They had control of Basra at this point, and then they sort of hopped over to seize this territory down here while the uh, Soviets came down to ta uh, attack uh, Tehran. And in World and Flames terminology, you know, it was the Soviet Union that conquered Iran and then had control of Iran. Now that's, you know, butting up against the Iran trade deal that is in place at the beginning of the game because Iran is neutral and supplies a common, the, the Commonwealth with one resource each turn. So, you know, so if you're looking at it and you go, well, you know, if the Allies were declaring war on Iraq, which is what the game needs you to do in order to, to operate in the historical narrative, and they're declaring war on Vichy, and they're de 
declaring war on Iran. Like, that's a lot of U.S. entry hits. And I do think it's interesting, you know, uh, the only thing I could say is, like, they're doing that with the expectation, maybe, that they've got good U.S. entry. I don't know. Um, the die rolls are such you could actually get away with not losing much for U.S. entry. Uh, you know, it's basically three fifty percent die rolls, so you could actually get away with only losing maybe a chit or something, uh, and all of that. But uh, if you were to look at these the campaign book and kind of see where the the distinction or the cutoff is, um, what's interesting is that the uh, the scenario, the four map scenario that starts. Uh, in May, June 1941, Liebenstrom uh, is, is the one where uh, it is, I, I guess, it, like considered that the Commonwealth has declared war on Iraq because the Germans set up uh, and actually set up a unit in Iraq. They set up this cavalry unit, and uh, Iraq is considered to be aligned with the uh, with the Germans at this point. Now that it doesn't, you know, the, the campaign guy doesn't tell you how this came to be, but there is no way for Iraq to align with uh, Germany unless Germany had four in supply corps uh, adjacent to Iraq, and they did not have four corps in Syria at this point. So, the I think the. The, the scenario, if you were to set up the Liebenstrom scenario for WIF, assumes that the Commonwealth has declared war uh, on uh, has declared war on Iraq, and then also will have been declaring war uh, on uh, Beachy for Syria. And I'm trying to see, I'm like, I have this on, on another screen. Um, Somewhere in here it says, yes, uh, Vichy is at war, but not hostile to the Commonwealth and free France. So, so they have declared war. The Commonwealth has declared war in Vichy. Like that, that is how those situations would come to pass. Um, now the distinction here is like when Vichy is at war, they're active, which means Germany could land an HQ and some units here up to foreign commitment levels and operate in Syria, but uh, I think the idea is that the Allies have to act swiftly because the Germans aren't really in a good position to do this because they're about to invade the Soviet Union. Um, they don't have the, they're not in a good position to try to ship a bunch of stuff over to Syria. So the, the Allies want to make use of that and they capture, capture Syria um, and then they're in a better position for Iran. So what does that look like from, from a gameplay perspective, and, and how would you even get there? So the scenario, as you look at like the 1942 scenarios, or the November-December 1941 scenario, the day, li uh, day that live in infamy, I think is that's, that scenario? Is what it's, no, it's Waking Giant, my bad, in November-December 1941. In that scenario, uh, the British by now have conquered Iraq, and you know, obviously, the Soviet Union has conquered Iran, and they've and they've conquered Syria by this point. So that spanned of so many months. But the unit that is noted as, as being set up in uh, Iraq, there is actually one. I'm gonna move this over for a second. So if you're looking at the the setup charts for Waking the Giant, the Commonwealth has in Iraq an Indian mech unit that is supposed to set up. It here, so you know whether it's Basra or whatever, you get to set up a unit. The most likely unit that that would be is this 1940 white print mechanized infantry uh, that is from India 775, which is a pretty potent unit. So if if we were examining like the somewhat expected way that the historical narrative is followed, it would be this unit that operates. Now the player notes in in for these scenarios uh, in the campaign book, tend to talk about like, well, you could send a couple core and an HQ and that would be enough to conquer Iraq. I don't think you're, I, I think it's unlikely that you're gonna see that many units trying to come into Iraq to conquer it. I, I feel like that's unlikely. And it seems like if we were just saying like, what is the game 
portray because ultimately the uh, the HQs that the Commonwealth is going to have at its disposal at that point are off elsewhere. Like they're they're off uh, maybe in Egypt or they're in Gibraltar or they're in the UK. So the way I see this kind of coming together, and I and I bring this up because I feel like it's it's possible for newer WIF players to completely miss out on these things because if you if you're if you're only learning pop history World War II. You might not even know about the Iraq campaign or what's referred to as the Anglo-Iraqi War or Operation Exporter or the Anglo-Soviet invasion of Iran. You might just not might not even know that that was a thing that happened. Um, I mean, you know, high school World War II history probably does not teach that. Um, and because of the Vichy rules being so weird and funky, I could see where a new player doesn't even know that they can declare war on Syria uh, and get into here without it being a major, major problem uh, for for the Allies. Like, just that, like, oh, Syria's, you know, Vichy's neutral, so we don't want to mess with them, and we're just going to wait for the Axis to, uh, to collapse Vichy. Like, no, for sure, you want to be trying to get into here and, uh, you know... E- it's an option at least to come in here and gain control and do these things. So it seems like the narrative would be if you're playing um, or maybe you're starting in the 1940 or 1941 scenario, May, June, that uh, remember that Kuwait is Commonwealth controlled at the beginning of the game. And, you know, obviously you're going to be fighting to defend Egypt. That's kind of a priority. But as you start to get additional units or you get stuff built in India, you know, you would want to be looking at garrisoning uh, Aden, 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 I'm not sure how that's properly pronounced, um, to defend this important, this is a very important hex uh, if the Italians are making headway over here. Um, but, you know, you want to eventually, like, if you get this unit built uh, against pretty strong good unit, 1940 force pool, uh, while France is falling, maybe, you've built this unit, you got them in Bombay, you transfer this guy into Kuwait. If you don't already have some kind of garrison there, then the garrison can help. But you at least want to get a stronger unit here. And then, uh, again, until Vichy is declared, Iraq is still part of the decent folk, and they're given one of these oil resources to the Allies. But once this goes Vichy, they don't. So if you want to keep the Axis, you want to keep Germany from getting another oil, and I think that's a valuable risk prop- proposition, right? Keep the Germans from getting oil. The Allies will declare war on uh, Iraq. That is a 50% chance of losing a U.S. entry chip. And then what's going to happen is the uh, this Iraq Royal Cavalry Corps will get set up. You'll probably set him up here uh, in the swamp. Um, rather than all the way back here in Baghdad, um, because then you're just ceding this territory or this, you know, this terrain, this good terrain to the British. So if you set it up here, then it's going to be, you know, the first thing is going to be this unit and whatever is accompanying it attacking this unit. So this unit sitting in swamp will get uh, doubled to four. The river would divide the attacker in half, but this would be considered surprise. So that would not matter. Um, so you would at least have seven. If you have another garrison or div here in Kuwait, maybe you're up to eight. And then what you should have is ideally maybe a ship or two to provide shore bombardment. Maybe you have some air power as well. And you're you're ideally getting something maybe like at least two to one odds, uh, if not more, and then maybe you're rolling a really risky die roll here. Um, again, there's probably different ways you can look at, you know, how to increase those bonuses to, to make it better. Um, it's kind of hard to hard to say. Uh, you, in it, you're going to be using the assault table no matter what due to the swamp. But I guess the assumption is like, hey, you you're going to have taken these guys out, and you make an advance into Basra. Now, Basra is a port, which means you can trace supply out of here. You're still in supply. 
uh, even without an HQ, being in Basra, it's also on the coast. So assuming you have convoy points in the Persian Gulf, which you will need, um, and whatever other ships you had, then these guys are fine. On the Axis Impulse, they're going to put in their militia here. Now this militia is pretty weak. It's, it's the Baghdad militia. They're going to go in face down as a reserve in Baghdad. And then on the next uh, Impulse, um, you're going to have to move these guys up. You're not going to want to move into uh, the swamp because the Pacific map swamp uh, movement is nine movement points, which would cause your guys to flip, and, and we don't want to do that. So what you would do is you'd move them up to here and then attack these guys face down in Baghdad. Now they would suffer uh, the river penalty, so this would become from seven to four uh, against two, so two to one, uh, so a plus four plus another uh, two because of the flipped unit, so it's a plus six. If you manage to get some other air support in here, uh, you could probably get that a little bit higher, maybe mo up more towards plus seven or plus eight to your die roll. And if you roll reasonably well, these guys come in and you'll have been able to say that you conquered Baghdad. Uh, or will we'll conquer Iraq in the uh, conquest phase. In terms of supply, uh, when you attack from here, you are in supply because you're counting basically um, one, two hexes to Basra, and then uh, the wherever you're tracing supply to, if that's India, the other two hexes as part of your supply line would be, you know, Bombay or whatever. So it's, you know, one, two, three, four hexes, you're fine. You would advance into Baghdad at that point after winning the combat, and you would potentially be out of supply here um, because you're counting too many, you count four hexes to Basra, and then it would be another, it would be too far for the five, six to Bombay. Um, but assuming that you're not dealing with any other Axis units or you're still face up and you're fine, you conquer Baghdad, and then I believe the capital becomes a secondary supply source. So then you're tracing supply through the swamp to Basra uh, along the rail line, and then you're tracing to Bombay, and you're and you're good to go at that point. And while you know once you finish doing that, you're probably then going to work to move this unit somewhere over here or over here to be prepared for an attack on Iran later. But here's where we're, we'll we'll pause that conversation and then talk about uh, Syria by comparison. So still wanting to make sure we clean that up. Um, the game scenario setups would say that, you know, maybe there's one Vichy infantry here, probably set up in Damascus. Um, and you would be basically having to pick some units out of the North Africa front, which could be dangerous, like just depending on how hard the Italians or the Germans are fighting here in North Africa. Um, you may not have a lot of reinforcements. Maybe you can bring in some other Indian or Australian units, uh, which would be sort of the historical source of these guys. Bring them into Suez or Port Said. Uh, have them then move up through here. You're declaring war on uh, Vichy France, which would be another 50% chance of losing a U.S. entry jet. And your goal is basically to would, would be eliminating, you know, again, the scenario would say there's probably one infantry here in a real game, you know, maybe the Axis player has put a lot of effort into to garrisoning Syria, but you knock out this unit, you take Damascus, which is, uh, Beirut looks like a capital that's only in Patton and Flames when Lebanon is a separate country. So you take Damascus, you conquer Syria, and then uh, this means that if the Axis did want to try to come back into Syria, they would be having to do a naval invasion or coming through Egypt. And that's just a lot harder than uh, if they collapsed Syria and they had something set up where they could enter more easily, something along those lines. So you're just kind of guaranteeing uh, the control of this space and uh, less fearful of if the Germans were uh, going to, say, invade Turkey or try to invade Iraq uh, from the Caucasus or something. 
Um, from there, the final sort of thing here uh, would be Iran. And so kind of a similar thing. It's going to depend on who declares war on Iran first and how. Um, so, you know, you could probably wind up in a situation where it's like, oh, uh, the Commonwealth and the Soviet Union both declare war on Iran, which I, I'm not sure what the order of operations historically there, but, you know, basically Iran has to set up one unit, this Royal Cavalry unit, not terribly strong, and they have to either set up against the Soviet Union or they're going to set up against the Commonwealth. And this is where you can kind of get you know, the weird order of operations. Like, you could do maybe the Commonwealth on one impulse and have it set up like this. Then the Axis goes, they put their reserve here, then the Soviet Union declares war and then comes in and you're both fighting like this. Or some other permutation, right? You could have uh, these guys set up right here, basically giving away uh, this territory down here. The you know, Commonwealth walks across from Basra and takes Bandar Shapur uh, just to kind of help seize the territory. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union, and this is tough because they're in the middle of Operation Barbarossa at this point historically. This is why there's always an early game gambit to try to take Iran early. Like that's always an option and it's a worthwhile one just to get them out of the way. Um, he <laughs> is though that is sketchy u.s entry that early in the game um a little risky uh you know the soviet union would ideally have some core that can come down and then attack but what may be in place is the reserve that's going to go into tehran uh, tehran and you know it's going to look like this as the defense um but either way assuming that the soviets can come down here if they're able to take Tehran um, with the help of, you know, the British in some capacity, they did send forces over to help, um, though the capital is really what matters in this game. Um, if, and if the Soviets have trouble, then, you know, the British can be thinking about coming up the railroad uh, and doing something, but by then they probably need an HQ to be in supply. So that's kind of the trick with that one. Um, but once this is kind of down packed, right, the, uh, these guys are destroyed, the Soviets have control of Tehran, the whole, the whole reason they did this historically, while the Commonwealth were getting a resource from Iran in, in a trade agreement in game terms, this, this is kind of the controversial thing, like the, the British and the Soviets invaded Iran out of a sense of expediency and convenience. And that sounds kind of messed up, right? That's probably why we don't talk about it in the history books, pop history books, or your high school history books. Because um, it's like, oh, the Allies invaded a neutral country. That's not a nice thing to do, but, but they did it to open uh, another path of lend-lease to the Soviet Union um, so that they weren't merely relying on the Murmansk convoys or Vladivostok. They had another way to do it. And in game terms, if... Iran has been conquered by the Soviet Union, they get this uh, oil resource and they can take, you know, the this path up here to get get it another resource for their factories. Um, they can't get these two because there's no rail line, but because uh, major powers on the same side can use each other's convoys, the British could plop two convoys right here or more if they're dealing with some Saudi Arabia stuff. Um, but either way, they can they can put uh, some convoys here in the Persian Gulf and basically take take these resources, put them on a boat, put them back into Bandar Shapur, rather than trying to build a railroad in the mountains, which would be very cost prohibitive. And then that's three resources that are going to the Soviet Union where they were effectively getting none before, right? So they've, they've opened up this path. If the allies wanna get more convoys, and transfer resources from the Pacific or India or Africa or something. Um, they could ship it to the Soviet Union through uh, the ports here, uh, though there is a limit uh, to the number of ports uh, due to, I think it's like five. Uh, the Commonwealth can also use Basra because they've conquered Iraq, right? So they control this port as well. They can ship more into Basra 
go through the rail line and all the way up. So again, it's something important. There are other games, I think A World at War portrays this where like you spend some resource points to like open this up without actually going to war, though you can go to war with Iran and, and make it cheaper or something. So there are other games that portray this. I think, you know, if you didn't know this was a thing and you were kind of like new and you were playing World in Flames, you might not even realize this was a thing that you should be thinking about doing. Um, and all of this, I should say, uh, and uh, this video would be a little, maybe a different topic if I hit this, is prior to this, prior to even uh, the campaign in Iraq, the Commonwealth is probably using these same resources to be cleaning up the Horn of Africa and trying to, uh, you know, get rid of some of these ports that could provide problems. If somehow the Axis control of Egypt, then they're going to get more stuff to these ports. Um, so there is probably a, a, an aspect of this where, um, you know, in 1940, in those early phases, once Italy and the Commonwealth were at war, um, that this territory is getting looked at to resolve before you start putting resources into Iraq. But every World of Flames game is a little bit different. Can't guarantee that it's going to be that way or the other. Um, but there you go, guys. Just something to think about. I, you know, it's... World War II is this huge, huge topic, right? And a lot of folks focus on the obvious areas that always get the attention in terms of the historical detail. But there is some really interesting stuff to look at that did historically happen. Um, the, the campaign in Iraq, the campaign in Iran, and, you know, even looking back, I mean, that was only, you know, 80 years ago. Um, only 80 years ago. I guess 80 years is a long time, but, you know, the, this relationship that, that you know, the West, I guess, has with these countries and just, there's more to it than just the recent years, right? This, a lot of this stuff goes back, you know, to World War One. I. I feel like, you know, if you're the intermediate level pop history, you know, you learn about the, you know, the, the Western powers dividing up the Ottoman Empire and how a lot of that was a bad idea and how they did it and there's all this stuff there. But but somehow we gloss over the 40s and we gloss over the role that these countries had in World War II a little too easily. Um, you know, some deep tracks of history that folks don't always look at. But maybe, maybe folks like you and I, or, you know, if you're watching this, you're probably someone who likes history a lot. And maybe you, you know this stuff pretty well, but I, I just get the feeling like there's some folks out there that are not familiar with it. Um, and sure enough, World in Flames provides a good way to, to play through that and have it matter. There is a reason to, you know, you do this to keep that Vichy uh, French from enabling Germany uh, from getting in yet another oil that they're going to be highly dependent on, depending on what optional rules you're using. Um, obviously, just capturing Vichy to uh, maintain control of the Mediterranean um, is important opening another Lend-Lease path to the Soviet Union is important. And sure enough, this is one of the ways, I think like 25% of Lend-Lease came through uh, Iran. So it's like, do you wanna give up 25% capacity to keep the Soviet Union from collapsing uh, in your game of World in Flames? Something to think about. So I hope this was interesting. Uh, for those who are a little more experienced with World in Flames, if you got opinions on this stuff, uh, please let me know down in the comment section below. Uh, some things that happen in history are not always seen as like the optimal choice in World in Flames as a war game. We have the hindsight of history or the game mechanics can sometimes lead us to be doing different things than what happened historically, but uh, at least there's a path here. Um, so yeah, there you go, guys. Uh, hope you enjoyed. We'll see you in the next video. Uh, take care. Keep gaming.